build your life on your faith. Psalm 100 and verse 4 is our text for today. Psalm 100 and verse 4, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can watch and see here on the screen and follow along with these scriptures. Psalm 100 verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. That's a great verse, isn't it? Why don't we read it together? It's here on the screen here. Let's read it together out loud. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Father, help us today as we look into the scripture we expound on these things as you've laid it on our hearts. Help us to see things that maybe we've never even seen before. Help us to know how to walk more fully in all that you have provided for us in Christ Jesus. And we would ask in this atmosphere of faith and revelation of your word that people would receive answers. Answers to to. to Small questions, big questions, crisis, whatever it might be going on in people's lives, God speak to us today. Even beyond what I speak verbally here, let the Spirit of God bring enlightenment, illumination to our hearts so that people will know what to do, what to say, how to move forward. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. And amen. We'll come back to this verse in just a moment, but by way of introduction of the message, I just want to share with you a little bit of my history, and maybe you don't uh, know this, but I grew up in West Virginia. And so you know where West Virginia is, don't you? It's almost heaven. Absolutely. And so it's even on our license tags, you know, almost heaven, West Virginia. So if you want to get close to heaven, you go to West Virginia. Hallelujah. Or you might want to sing West Virginia Mountain Mama, right? Or something like that. But I grew up in West Virginia and, and uh, not only did I grow up there in a remote uh, area in the mountains, I mean, you, you, you'd have to have my help to find where I grew up and and uh, small roads, one little pavement down the middle with gravel on the side. So if something came the other way, you had to run off the road and just divide, you know. I, I go back there now and I think, how did we ever do this? I started out as a teenager driving cattle trucks on those roads and we'd fly, man. I mean, we, it just was part of what we did. You know, you come across a little knoll and there'd be a car and you'd just both split and just go around each other. And, and I, I couldn't do that today. I'm, I'm cityfied now. <laughs> but I grew up there in West Virginia. And so uh, not only did I grow up there, I grew up there as an Amish Mennonite boy. And so um, um, here's the reason I'm telling you that story is because when I moved to Sarasota, Florida, you would, it, it would have been a miracle for you to understand something I was saying. Uh, somebody says it's still a miracle. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. Still a miracle. But the reason it would have been a miracle is because my, my uh, first language was the Amish dialect of German. And so between that and my hillbilly talk, <laughs> we know it, and of course, uh, uh, let's just call it a southern accent. Between those two, I don't think people here knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and so, you know, today, and, and uh, Pastor Jennifer, my wife, is also from the south, North Carolina. She has retained that southern accent better than I have. Isn't it beautiful to listen to her talk? <laughs> It's like music. 
It's so, I mean, we go somewhere and people will say, where are you from? And because they hear her accent or they hear my accent, a little bit I have left of that, you know, and, and, uh, and they'll say, where are you from? And we'll say, well, we're from the South, you know, North Carolina, West Virginia. And so, well, I thought so. And of course, we listen to other people, you know, maybe a foreign accent, not a United States accent, some other country coming here speaking English or, or, or different parts of the country. And you go, where are you from? Where's that accent from, right? Where's that accent from? And that's oftentimes our conversation with people. Where's that accent from? Well, I'd like to talk to you today from this scripture and other scriptures about an accent we should have. I, I'm going to call it this, the accent of faith. I believe faith has an accent. And you know the word accent means what is predominantly displayed in your home or in a room or on your desk. The accents that you have there are how you decorate. It's what people notice when they walk in. It's the accents that, that are there, you know. I think people of faith ought to have an accent. And I believe the accent of faith is gratitude. People who really believe and trust God have an accent of gratitude. Thanksgiving ought to be our ought to be our decoration. It ought to be what people go, where are you from? I'm from an accent or I'm speaking an accent of faith. And it's gratitude. Why do you why are you so grateful? Because we're people of faith. We're people who believe. We believe in the provision of Jesus Christ. And if we really believe, there's nothing left to do but to be grateful for what He has done and provided for us. Our accent ought to be one of gratitude. More recognizable than my accent from West Virginia. More recognizable than my dialect of German that taints my speaking. More than that ought to be the accent of gratitude in the life of the believer. I, I personally, and this is just me personally, but I think I'm right. I, I think we can measure our level of faith by our gratitude. Because if you hear how we preach about faith here and the great teaching we've done on it the last few weeks, if we accept Him and believe in the provision of Him, there's nothing left but gratitude. There's no works we have to do to try to enter in. If we are already accepted in the Beloved, if we are made righteous through the work of Jesus Christ, what else is there to do but to thank Him for righteousness? Thank Him for the blessings of God. Thank Him for what He has done in our life. Gratefulness, thanksgiving ought to be the accent of our life. So this verse, now that we already read, let's look at it again. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and we'll break this scripture apart, but look at him first and say, I recognize your accent. <laughs> you sound good. Yeah, your accent is what? It's an accent of faith. Why are you so positive? Why are you so thankful? Because I'm a person of faith. I have an accent of faith. Everything I say is tainted with. That's the wrong word, isn't it? It's right, tainted. It's everything I say is filled with that accent. Even if I ask for a Coke, you know, New Yorkers, they don't ask for Coke. They ask for Coke, right? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> yeah. And uh, who are we listening to the other day with all the different accents? Oh, we were with, uh, we were listening to Brother Joseph Prince at Lakewood Church uh, two weeks ago. And, and, uh, and we were sitting there as a family listening to him and some of his, his accents, you know. 
uh, I think I told you about this the other week, but, but uh, since we're talking about accent, you know, and he, he would say, uh, uh, my son looked at me and said, what is he saying? And it was Capernaum. And that's Capernaum, the city of Capernaum. And he says, Capernaum. And uh, then he, he was talking about porno, uh, 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 pornography and he, he says pornography. And people have been delivered from pornography and, uh, and his beautiful Singaporean accent, you know. And see, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, it comes out. He, he can't help it because it's his accent. It's when I talk, I can't help it. I'm going to say, y'all come to the house, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm with the Apostle Paul. He was Southern too, you know, because he said, I pray in tongues more than ye all. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so no matter, no, matter, no matter what we're saying or asking for, our accent comes out. And if we're believers, friend, our accent of gratitude ought to be coming out everywhere. Let's be grateful. This is the week of Thanksgiving. And of course, you know by now, that's why I'm doing this message. So enter into his, what does it say? Enter into his gates with Thanksgiving. Let's just look at these words in the verse real quickly and break it down a little bit. I find it interesting that he says, enter his gates with Thanksgiving. Wouldn't you think you'd go in and see everything that's there and then be thankful going out? I find it interesting that we enter with thanksgiving. I believe that that speaks of our acceptance of Jesus Christ as the provision of it all. He is the door. You don't go in there and look and see everything and then thank Him for it. You accept Him for who He is. You enter in the door with thanksgiving for who He is. And that is faith. Whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We believe in him long before we see everything that's in the kingdom. We enter in with thanksgiving. It could also have this meaning that we enter into the things that he has provided with thanksgiving. If he has provided, there's a lot of things you don't have to be asking for. You just thank him because it's already yours. You know, some people are so big about we got to claim all these promises and make sure that you do this and make sure you do that and, and uh, like protection over their life, their family or whatever. I don't really concern myself too much with that because I believe if I'm in Christ, that's part of my inheritance. I believe Psalm 91 that says, He that dwells under the shadow of the Almighty... That means I'm under his cover, just like a little chick under the wings of a hen. I'm covered from the elements. I'm protected just because I'm in him. Yes, yes. I, if my protection was, was due or was, or was only valid if I'm careful to make sure I'm protected, man, what if I miss it just once? But in him, I'm always covered. So a lot of people waste, uh, I wouldn't say maybe, I shouldn't say waste, but a lot of energy, a lot of faith trying to, trying to receive things that are already theirs. So maybe he's saying that instead of trying to get or ask for things, you just enter in with thanksgiving. You see the provision and you, you, you go traveling. It's not up to you to make sure you're protected. Just thank him that you are. Just thank him that you are in him and his angels have been given charge over you. Amen. Amen. Psalm 91 there says, He that dwelleth under the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And then the next verse says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. And then the rest of the chapter catalogs the benefits of the person who is resting in the shadow of God, who has said, he is the one I trust. A lot of people read that chapter and go, well, I got to make sure I say that angels are around me. I got to make sure that I say this. Friend, if you're trusting in him, they're everywhere. You are surrounded by God's protection. 
His long life will He satisfy you and show Him your salvation. You don't even, I mean, just, just believe that you're in Him. So we enter in with thanksgiving. Can you see the difference? Entering in with thanksgiving says my provision's in Him. My provision is there. Entering in without thanksgiving says I'm still having to labor to get something. And I only give him thanks after I'm sure I've gotten it. But thanksgiving, entering in with thanksgiving says, I know where my provision is. It's right there. I enter in. But faith believes him. Faith starts the day with thanksgiving. Doesn't wait until good things happen and then at the end of the day, thank you for a good day or thank you for what happened or we measure our thanksgiving based on how the day went. Faith enters in. Thanksgiving enters, lets us enter in with thanksgiving. Why? Because we already believe that this is going to be the best day of our life. We get up in the morning, we enter in the gate of the day with thanksgiving. Believers have an accent. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you got an accent. I recognize. It's an accent of faith. It's an accent of faith. It's gratitude. <laughs> Hallelujah. We enter in. This is so much a part of the life of a believer entering in. Think about the first fruits we bring. Tithes. Those are first fruits. We don't bring the last part. We don't wait to see if we have enough. We bring the first fruits. We enter in with we enter in. This is all throughout Scripture. We believe and therefore we speak. We don't wait until we see and then speak. We believe and we enter in with speaking. There's something about believers that enter in. Other people look at believers and go, how can you be like this in the middle of what you're going through? Because I enter in. I'm a believer. Faith is a powerful, powerful thing. And faith is trust in Jesus and all that he has provided and done for us. If we really believe that. We'll, we will have a true accent of gratefulness. Psalm 118, the next phrase I want to look at from the verse or text, but while you're turning to Psalm 118, is we enter His gates. We enter His gates with thanksgiving. His gates. And there's lots of things that gates mean and have symbolism about I'm just going to use a very simple one today, entering his gates. Let's read this scripture. Psalm 118, verse 19 through 24. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. Woo! This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. How many have ever used this verse, and I use it right along with you, but how many have ever used this verse to talk about your day? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's say it together. It's a good one, isn't it? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now let's be glad just a little bit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Help your neighbor laugh a little bit. Let's be glad just a little bit. This is the day we will rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> Take a little laughter as your medicine. It's good for you. Oh, that's a great verse to use for our day, but <clears throat> I want to tell you, 
this morning that that's a great verse you can use, but it's not the true meaning of the verse. The true meaning of the verse, this is what we call a messianic psalm. This is a prophecy about Jesus. And the gate he's asking and interceding for is that the gate of righteousness would be opened. And then he goes on, and I'll go through it if that gate is open. I'll praise the Lord. And then he talks about the stone which the builders rejected. We know that's Jesus. The stone which the builders rejected. And then it says, this was the Lord's doing. I love this. Verse 23. This was the Lord's doing. Our redemption, our righteousness, our salvation had nothing to do with us. He opened the gate of righteousness. It was a work of the Lord that opened this gate for us. And we walk through it. And then it says, this is the day the Lord has made. This day of redemption, the Lord made it. This day that you can say, I am the righteousness of God apart from any works of my own. This is the day the Lord has made. The day he hung on the cross and did all of that. That work was a day the Lord has made, and that's the day we will rejoice and be glad in it. That's the true meaning of the verse. You can use it the other way. There's no problem there. The scripture is powerful enough for that. But thank God this is the day the Lord has made. Nobody was able to redeem themselves. He made this day for us, and this is His day, and it's our, it's our response to rejoice and be glad in it. If it's His day, the day the Lord has made, what else is there left to do but to give thanks? Thank you, Jesus, for this day that opened the gates of righteousness. Now, how are we to enter into those gates? Those gates are his provision. Uh, you've got it by now, don't you? It's his day. We're entering into what he has done, what he has provided. When you are thankful, it is like you entering into the provision of God. It's saying your gates, your place, your day, what you have done is what I'm entering into. And the only response I have in this vast provision of yours is I come in here with thanksgiving. Thank you that there is the light. There is the food. There is the sacrifice. There is everything I need. Within his gates is everything that I need for life and eternity. And I enter those gates with thanksgiving. Woo! Thanksgiving. Let's look at a, at a New Testament scripture. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Very familiar scripture. Therefore, by him... Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. This is at the end of the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 is a very famous verse that a lot of people know about faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And as you've heard, if you've been at this church any length of time, you know that the meaning of that verse is that now we're in the age of faith, where faith is the substance of everything they hoped they'd get when they went to the Hebrew tabernacle or temple, the place of worship, the place of sacrifice. They bring a lamb and they hope for righteousness. Sins were covered for that, for that year. Everything was a type and a shadow pointing forward to the antitype, the real, which was Jesus Christ. But now that Jesus has died, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, now that he has died, now that he has become everything, faith now is the substance of that. You don't need an altar. 
You don't need a sacrifice. You don't need to bring a lamb. You don't, need to, you don't need to have a Levitical priesthood to oversee your worship and your sacrifices. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. You don't have a religious prescription to follow. Now faith is the substance. Now faith. If you'll believe in him, he already made an altar for you. If you'll believe in him, the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. If you believe in him, everything you need is in him. He is now your high priest. He is the priest that you need. He is, and on and on, the list goes through the book of Hebrews. And literally the book of Hebrews, if you were to kind of sum it up, you could just say, you don't need to do that. He is. That basically the writer of Hebrews is saying to those Hebrew believers, don't worry that you're not going to have a temple because it's going to be destroyed. doesn't say that, but we know now from history it was going to be destroyed in about three years after this book was written. And then so he's saying to them, don't worry that you won't have a holy place, an altar. Don't worry because now faith is the substance. You could be scattered to Rome and there... Faith will be the substance of everything you need for your walk with God and relationship with Him. You won't need to build a temple over there. You won't need to construct another altar. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Woo! Man, that's good stuff. <laughs> wow! And so the book of Hebrews is basically saying nothing you can do Believe him and faith is the substance of all that for you. So then it comes down to this and says, hey, there's a sacrifice you can give. There is a sacrifice you should be giving continually and it's because of him. You should be giving this sacrifice of praise. The fruit of your lips giving thanks to his name. Friend, we ought to be thanking him continually because we don't have to bring a lamb. He already did it for us. I don't know about you, but it's worth thanking him today because I don't have to measure my good works today. I just look to him and I am the righteousness of God. I'm not measuring my acceptance based on how I think I've performed this week. I know from this promise of Scripture that I'm accepted in the Beloved. If He loves Jesus, He loves me. Glory, hallelujah. Well, what should that invoke? Some, some serious accent. Oh, Thanksgiving. I mean, you ought to be just kind of push people and go, just poke them a little, you know, and out of them should spill Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for all that he has provided. Bring the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Hallelujah. A heart of gratitude focuses on what's right instead of what's wrong. People who have an accent of, you know, the, one of the reasons we should be so grateful is because when you've been forgiven much, you're thankful for much. You're grateful for much. My friend, we've been forgiven a lot. And it ought to just invoke in us an attitude of thanksgiving and a heart of gratitude that focuses on what's right instead of what's wrong. It's easy to get stuck in focusing on what's wrong instead of what's right. And if you're stuck in that negative brainstorm, maybe through circumstances or through things that have happened in our life or just in our culture. And I, I don't like picking on things and people, but, but you know, uh, I, I like to watch the evening news and things because I like to know what's going on in the world. But then sometimes I'll watch some of the local news and, and so forth. And you go, man, you just wish they'd put more positive stuff up. You know, if they had followed me today, 
If they had highlighted what I had done today, it would have been some amazingly positive stuff. But no, they got to find, you know, and that's just the culture we live in. That's okay. Just don't get stuck there ourselves. There's a lot going on today. While it may look like because it's piped into your home or written on pages, you may be looking at things and going, wow, the world is in a mess. But you know how many churches are filled with people worshiping God this morning? All over Sarasota. I mean, there are thousands of people at church in this county alone. There are over in this country, people are worshiping God. Friend, let's stop looking at what's negative and look at what's positive. This week alone, I visited people at the hospital. I, le- I prayed with people. I followed people. I went to visit, did things so positive and so amazing. This week alone, you could have followed me with a camera, let alone all of us. But if you watch and look at the wrong source and feed on it, you'd think everything is bad. Focusing on what's, that's a, that is a grateful heart. Look at your neighbor and say, you got an accent. <laughs> yeah, people get stuck in these negative patterns. And I found one of the great ways to get out of that pattern is to use things that come negatively if you, because we, we start, I don't know what it is about the flesh. It likes to attach itself to negative things. I think it's the fallen nature of the natural man. That's just my personal opinion, but I think I'm right. And so, <laughs> and so, and so uh, it just seems like we go that way. Have you ever noticed you put a bucket of hot water out and unless you put a fire under it, it cools off? Our flesh is a lot that way. Unless you throw your hands up and worship Him, it just eventually, you just kind of drop and drop and drop and drop until, until you stick your hands in your pocket. And it's like, hey, give me something. And the spirit man has to break that, has to go, oh no, my, I will make my boast in the Lord. Come on, lift those hands up because eventually you just drop them, drop them, drop them. The flesh, unless you keep a fire under it, it just cools off. And you, what you used to be excited about, now you'll criticize because pretty soon you just, it just goes down, down. The flesh just, <laughs> our, our time's up, aren't you glad? <laughs> <laughs> So what I found to break that, the best thing to break that, whether it's even temptations or, but today I'm talking about negative things. People just get stuck in that pattern. Uh, Friend, you may be in that pattern and you may be there for good reason because things have happened in your life, but you don't have to stay there. And I found the best way to break those things is to use the prompts of negative things to turn it to positive. So instead of just allowing those things to rule, so when that comes, if you're kind of stuck there with that kind of a thing going on in your mind, because whether you like it or not, there are, called, there are neural pathways that our brain likes to cut grooves. And you'll get into something and it, it literally cuts a pathway in your mind, in your brain, and you're, you'll always want to go there. You see something and you just want to be negative about it. That's a, that's, a, that's a little channel you've cut. And everything wants to flow in there. So it takes some work to put dirt back in that channel and cut a new groove. And so when, if, if you're there, and we get there because life hits us, you know. How many have lived a little bit? You know, life isn't all fairy tales. Life has negative things, but we don't want that negative thing to get in us. Like somebody said, doesn't matter how much water and how much storm is going on around you, as long as you stay in the boat and don't let the water get in the boat. Doesn't matter how much water there is. Just don't let it get inside you. 
And so take those prompts, if you're stuck somewhere there, and just turn them to positive. Oh, it's always cold in here. Uh, just change it and go, thank God we have a place to sit. You see? You see? Uh, man, we, we don't have any air conditioning in our house. So thank God we have a house. The, the negative wants to say, you know, uh, this old bucket of bolts that I'm driving, this piece of junk car, just switch it and go, thank God I got some wheels under me. I can at least get a half mile down the road. <laughs> I'm telling you, it works. It works in every area of your life. Take those prompts and turn them to something positive. Well, we hardly have any space here at all for, thank God, I at least have a little square foot. Thank God we have a little space. Huh? There's so much pollution in the air. And, oh, what's going to happen? Thank God I'm still breathing. Thank God for this breath. I just take those things and turn them and cut a new groove until the river of gratitude is so cut in your mind, in your brain, that you can't hardly be negative. It would be difficult for you to be negative because we enter with thanksgiving. Well, that's kind of the natural side of thanksgiving. Aren't you glad we can be thankful? But I'll tell you, I believe there's a powerful spiritual side to gratefulness. Here's why I believe that one reason among lots of others, but I'll give you this one. When Jesus introduced communion, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, the bread and the cup. When he introduced that, how did he do it? It says he took bread and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them and said, eat, this is my body. When he took the cup in the same manner, he gave thanks and gave them the cup, said, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant. I don't know, I don't know what that might do to you, but I think, I think that it was that giving of thanks that caused that to be more than bread and more than a cup. It wasn't asking for it to be. It was thanking God for the provision. And think about it. When Jesus did it, he spoke as if it were now, but he was still going to give his body and his blood as a ransom. So he was in that room at Passover before he even shed his blood, before it was even a really a reality, but he's entering with thanksgiving. And I believe that night, that bread and that cup was more than bread and wine. Because he, I'm just going to make it simple like this. I believe God gets into our thanksgiving. I believe God works in our thanksgiving. I wonder what might happen if we quit asking for so much, so much stuff and just started thanking him. Thank you that I'm a healed person because by his stripes I was healed. Thank you. And the same way Jesus looked forward to Calvary with that, with that bread and cup and gave thanks for the provision in the bread and the cup and what it represented... We now can look back with the bread and the cup or with thanksgiving to the provision of Calvary and go thank you for everything you've given to me. Get up in the morning, enter the gates with thanksgiving. Thank you that I'm healthy today. Thank you that I'm strong today. Thank you that I'm blessed today. Thank you that I'm righteous today. Thank you for... You know from what we preach here at, at Shining Light that it would be absolutely, it would be absolutely ridiculous. 
I mean, we, 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 we have no problem. I think everybody who sits under our teaching at all would be absolutely appalled if we said or preached or asked people to come to this altar who are believers to ask God for righteousness. Wouldn't we? I mean, we would just go, what are they doing? Don't they know they are the righteousness of God? And so with the same attitude, now we can come for healing. There is provision. Lay hands on the sick, anoint with oil. That's new covenant stuff. So we can't deny that. But we still don't want to come to apply those provisions with an attitude of we have to try to get that. Why don't we come with an attitude of thanksgiving, gratefulness. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for, for the laying on of hands. Thank you for anointing with oil. It's just, it's just like the bread and the cup. It speaks of my provision. Thank you for what you have done. Look at your neighbor and tell him you got a serious accent. I recognize it. I recognize it. It's an accent of faith. You believe you have, and you are thankful for what he has provided. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We praise you today. Let this be a day that we are stirred in our hearts with thanksgiving towards you. And because it's an accent of our life, let gratefulness let gratefulness be in every word. Let gratefulness be shown to people. Let gratefulness be shown in, in our circumstances, our relationships, our entire life. God, let gratefulness be the accent of our life because we embrace the finished work of Jesus Christ, which means it's provided. And from that fountainhead flows gratefulness to every person we meet. Hallelujah. Somebody gets angry at us, we, we, we can say, thank you for giving me the opportunity to show kindness. Instead of, instead of engaging in those things, we can say, thank you for the opportunity for patience. Thank you that for the opportunity of walking in the fruit of the Spirit. Thank you for the opportunity of being Christ-like in every situation. We're grateful. We're grateful. As the worship team comes with every head bowed and every eye closed, as we prepare to dismiss this morning, please, if you can just stay with us and as we believe together, trust in his provision. We'll dismiss in just a few moments. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you, would you express your faith in Jesus Christ this morning? Would you say yes to the provision of Calvary? That provision is your eternal security. It is your righteousness. It's what we call your salvation. Everything that's a problem, everything that's missing, everything that would be a hindrance between you and God has been taken care of. That's called salvation. Would you receive him today? If you believe on him, Somebody says, well, what do I have to do? Do I have to change this? Do I have to do? Don't worry about that. Just believe in him and his provision is yours. That's my first invitation. Second invitation is if you'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. Here at Shining Light, you can come. You can receive what Acts chapter 2 calls speaks about they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Yes, you can come and be filled with the Holy Spirit.